Welcome to Series 11. We recorded this right after we returned from a catacon, so we may not be as chipper and charismatic as usual, <laughs> but we promise you are still going to enjoy this series. Mm-hmm. And for the announcements, uh, I'll start it off. We, If you are interested in coming to Wisconsin in January... Which everyone should be. You, should, like, you, should, you be. should come to Wisconsin in January. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best time. <laughs> Why? Oh, if you love snow. Perfect time to come here. <laughs> uh-huh. All our friends from California, come to Wisconsin yeah, in January. Texas, Florida, come visit mm-hmm. us. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to be at the Midwinter uh, Gaming Convention in Milwaukee, and I will be running more playtests of Chimera. So if you missed out at a Catacon or you just want to play it again, Check out the convention and sign up if you want to keep up with what is happening with the game. You can follow along on Twitter at ChimeraRPG, or you can head to our Discord at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I am really hoping that I will get to be there. I haven't bought my ticket yet, um, and I don't know what my schedule will be, but I'm really hoping to get a chance to be there, too. And maybe you and I can do something together. That'd be fun. That, that'd be awesome. Yeah. I've got two games on Saturday, four-hour blocks each, so nice. I would love it if you would be able to go and sign up for one of those. Yeah, that would be a lot of fun. We'll see. Awesome. Because I'm, you know, actually in Milwaukee. I really have no excuse to not go. <laughs> exactly. I live here. Make- Make time. (laughs) Gosh darn it. I can find four (laughs) hours on a Saturday. Exactly. Uh, If we are sharing exciting, cool stuff that we're doing, then guess what? I'm doing another podcast. What? I know. Number three. (laughs) Uh, My friend Jude of the Atherbeth podcast and former guest on our show uh, and I are starting our own podcast where we are going to talk about L5R. Because that was the thing you all needed more of in your life, was me talking about L5R. (laughs) The game has a ton of lore, and so we are going to dig through all of it and share our thoughts on some of the cool and silly and stupid parts of it. Episode 1 is going to release on January 8th. You can find us at G5R Podcast on Twitter or at garbageofthefiverings.com. I love that name. I know. I'm really excited about it. We have, oh my gosh, we have (laughs) such good art too. Um, Jess did, she did such a good job. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah, It is so good. Awesome. Well, if you want to tell us all the awesome stuff that we're doing on this podcast, uh, you can go and leave it a review on iTunes or on Stitcher or even on our Facebook page. Um, And you can leave reviews like this one from Mothlands from the United States. It is titled, Good for Players and GMs Alike, and it simply says, An excellent and entertaining way to dive into a system. Short and sweet. Uh, Short and sweet. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much. That was a really good uh, and concise review. With all of that out of the way, here's the episode. Enjoy. Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan, and this episode, my co-host Amelia and I welcome several members of the Magpies Podcast, a Blades in the Dark actual play podcast. We are here to discuss character creation for Blades in the Dark, a fantasy role-playing game system by Evil Hat Productions. Welcome to Character Creation Cast. Thank you for having us. Yeah, we're excited to be here. I'm really excited for this one. This is one I've wanted to talk about for a long time. I say a long time, like we've been doing this podcast forever. <laughs> since I mean, since April. This is, I mean, it's this is series 11, so like that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited about this. Um, let's start with Reed. Do you want to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about your projects, what you've got going on? Yeah, so I'm Ree. Uh, I am the GM and producer of the Magpies podcast. 
Um, we post episodes uh, every other Tuesday. Yeah, that's kind of the big thing that I have going on right now. I am in the process of getting a, um, a freelance sort of side business together that's going to be copy editing and um, digital document accessibility for the RPG community. But that is still a work in progress. <laughs> um, so if you're interested in that, uh, keep an eye on my Twitter and I will share it there uh, whenever mm-hmm. it actually becomes a, a real thing and not just sort of a half finished project. Mm-hmm. Everything has to start somewhere. Yep. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, Josie, how about yourself? Uh, hi, I'm Josie. Um, I play Minx on the Magp- Magpies podcast, um, and I also do character art and design. Best place to find all my stuff is my Twitter, at Dragon Girl Josie. Nice. And Minna, what about you? Um, I'm Minna. Uh, I'm a player on Magpies, obviously. I'm also a player in the Iron Heights podcast, which probably by this time this comes out. It'll be it, it launches tomorrow, so probably it'll be out by yes. Yes. <laughs> it's not out tomorrow. So <laughs> I do not have that quick of turnaround. So no. I am also a player on the Iron Heights podcast, which should be up on the One Shot Network by the time this comes out. Yay! Excellent. Um, All right. Yeah, that's basically what I'm involved in. Very cool. Well, let's go ahead and get into this, and we will start by discussing what this game is all about. What's in a game? All right. So. Can we go ahead and talk a little bit about the setting of Blades in the Dark? Sure, I can. I can jump on this one because I usually, I'm usually the one that has to like when I'm running. (laughs) Well, when I'm running cons or when I get when I'm running games at cons or when I am, um, you know, doing kind of like promo stuff for the magpies i have to explain it so um the setting is uh industrial fantasy so rather than sort of the like pseudo medieval fantasy of D &D, um this is kind of at a um victorian era level of technology so there are uh like steam powered stuff there's electricity there's guns um there are you know, big steamships. Uh, the I, I I really can't do the setting any more justice than the uh, kind of elevator pitch that the book has, which is you're in a haunted Victorian era city, trapped inside a wall of lightning powered by demon blood. Oh yeah, like you yeah. do, <laughs> as you do. So yeah, it's it's a few different things. So you have this sort of the industrial era stuff um, with all of the. Uh, social and class uh, implications that that carries. Um, It is also haunted. Uh, The setting is kind of a post-apocalyptic one. About nine centuries before present day, um, there was some kind of magical cataclysm that um, shattered the sun. Uh, So it is basically dark. It is night permanently in this setting. Um, And broke the gates of death. So now when people die, their spirits do not move on. Their spirits just sort of linger, and lingering spirits tend to become uh, angry and hungry and prey on the living. So the lightning barrier around the main city of Duskwall keeps ghosts out, generally speaking. But it means that outside that lightning barrier is extremely dangerous. So it creates this pressure cooker situation where you can't expand. The city cannot get any larger than it currently is. Every scrap of territory in the city is already claimed by someone. So for uh, a new, a brand new crew of, of scoundrels starting <laughs> off in this city, uh, you are going to be taking, if, if you want territory, you have to take it. Ooh. Yeah. So it's it's a very it's a very cool setting. I like it a lot. Yeah, it sounds really wild. I feel like there's a lot going on there that you can kind of play a wide variety of games in that setting. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. And I really love. Um, so in the book, there's laid out like little. I'm going to show this to you guys on web camera, <laughs> but I'm also going to explain this because it's an audio medium. But there's little. <laughs> um, there's little neighborhood pages. So every neighborhood in Duskwall has like a little two-page spread that gives you some landmarks, it gives you descriptions of what it looks like, it gives you a couple of notable figures there, and it just really like, it's a nice little gazetteer to kind of get you grounded in the setting, but also enough details left out that you can make up what you want to. That's and awesome. it does a really good job yeah. of like getting you really, really familiar with the city. 
um, and having knowing the character of each neighborhood without, mm-hmm. I don't know, the sort of D&D aspect of, okay, here's every block mapped out, and here's yeah. where everything exactly is. <laughs> it's like that PBTA, like Dungeon World, in uh, especially I think of, has this rule of like, draw a map but leave blanks, and Blades yeah. does a really good job of that. Oh, that's very cool. So, what... Aside from the book, which we always assume you need to play this game, what other kinds of tools do you need? What kind of dice do you use? Any other peripherals? 2d6, and that's about it. Uh, sometimes you need more than 2d6. Oh, sorry, you're right. Yeah, it's yeah. not... You, you yeah. may need up it's... to 4d6. I don't know <laughs> yeah. of any situation where you can... You Maybe could... Maybe 5 if you're really, really good. 4 to 5 d- d6. Sorry. In, in theory... You could push things up if you you had the max number of points in a skill, you pushed yourself and you got help from a friend, you could make a 66 roll on something. That is the maximum number of dice that it is possible to roll in in this game. So at most you need 66. So Uh, there's like a cube of dice because (laughs) you can't ever have too many anyway. That's uh-huh. correct. Oh. Plus, it looks nicer when you have 20 of them stacked on top of each other. Mm-hmm. My 50-some D6s might have to argue with you. <laughs> <laughs> you love all of them individually. For who? Uh, not the 36 green ones. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, so what do characters do in this game? I know in D&D, you go on adventures and stuff, and masks, you play superheroes. Uh, but what do characters generally do in Blades in the Dark? Crime. Okay. You do. Be you do. I mean, like that's the, that's that's the, the the pithy answer. But no, I mean, it is it is a game about playing a, a crew of criminals um, mm. doing crimes in this this city. So that sounds like heists. Yes, you you yeah. yeah you've got heists and scores and um you you uh, based on what kind of crew you uh, decide to be, um, which we'll get into a little bit later. That kind of picks your like the type of crime you want to do. Um, but yeah, basically you, you are playing a bunch of criminals. And like the game structure is very much the main, main action is a score. Like you're doing a criminal score somewhere in the session and that's going to be kind of the core of it. Mm-hmm. There's supporting stuff as well. And you play like a longer game with the other crews, but I feel like this score is usually the centerpiece of our sessions at least. Mm hmm. So it's probably a good thing to have a character that's at least a little bit selfish. You'd say that, and then you'd look at the magpies. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, we're selfish in our own ways. Uh, Occasionally. Occasionally you have been known to exhibit moments of greed, (laughs) but the the magpies started off as the, the, the thief crew. Um, as shadows, uh, and we they were very bad at it. they were very bad at it. They are very, <laughs> very bad at being thieves. Like, how long yeah. has it been since we've earned money? <laughs> A very long time. <laughs> it's um. I mean, you made some money off of that score where you broke into the farm. I guess did we? Yeah, yeah, did you we? did. Oh, I, I guess oh, we right. stole some of it. We we gave a lot of it to Bazo though. Yeah, you. Yeah, they they're really bad at making money, <laughs> um, which is why they're not thieves anymore. That's but amazing. yeah, in general, you're gonna you you are playing characters who um, maybe they are not necessarily selfish, but they are willing to go against the established order. Mm, okay. What do you guys think is particularly unique about this game? Well, one is the setting, but I it. Lets you do a lot of complex drama, sort of spur of the moment. Um, a lot of the structure of the scores is you don't spend a lot of time planning exactly how everything's going to go down. Mm. You do you do some prep, but then you go into the score, and then you can do things like flashbacks and certain actions to retroactively prepare for things and sort of adjust as things go on. Mm. Um, so it allows for a lot of complexity without bogging things down too much with a lot of complex rules, which I really like. Yeah, it it takes that that very traditional thing that you see in a heist movie where like, uh, you know, the, 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 the criminal heroes get into some kind of bind and you're like, oh man, they're totally screwed. And then there's a flashback to show how they prepared for it. 
mm-hmm. that there is a mechanic in this. There's actually a couple mechanics in this game for that precise situation. Um, it, it's it's designed to make your t- your characters look extremely competent. Um, like one thing I really like is the way equipment works. Mm-hmm. You don't like when you're going on a score, you don't say, okay, I'm going to bring my lock picks and my demolition tools and this and that and the other. You just say, I'm bringing five things. Hmm. And then throughout the score, when you get to a situation where you need a thing, you just go, okay, one of the things I brought is this tool that we need right now. Yeah. So it's just you, your characters look like they are super competent and very prepared and, and planned for every eventuality. Until they're not. <laughs> Until the dice turn, and <laughs> <laughs> as they do. But, I mean, it, it allows you to make it seem like within the narrative, like your characters spent a week planning without actually having the players spend three hours planning. And then as soon as the first die, you know, die roll happens, the whole plan falls apart. Mm-hmm. And I love also that so much of it, like... You're not going to have a lot of just pure successes. Uh, I think there's only like one, there's like two results. You can get a six or you can get two sixes and that's like a pure success. But like most of the time you're going to be getting like partial success. Mm. And that really like those, there are consequences that come with those that really drives that story forward as well. Yeah, I like the idea of not having to spend all kinds of time sitting in that like out of character negotiation that you do trying to think like, okay, how is the GM going to try and ruin this beautiful plan that I've come up with? And I have to plan for every contingency. Mm -hmm. And you start to get into like your third and fourth level of hypotheticals of like, well, what if this? But then if that happens, and then what if this? And Mm -hmm. you start to kind of like spiral out of control after a while. And I feel like that really hurts the momentum of a game. And so I like the idea of having mechanics built in to kind of cut that off. Mm Mm-hmm. And yeah. With blades too. You almost want things to go wrong because it's more fun that way. Yeah. Oh, I feel There's that way in like, like most games, but I know not everybody does. <laughs> we yeah. have brought up that beautiful, beautiful mechanic, the Devil's Bargain. Yes, thank you. And it's I was going to so bring it up. Good. It's basically saying, "Hey GM, give me an extra die in this roll. In re- and in return, there will be some consequence that happens regardless of how I do it." And most of the, a lot of the time, that will be like a really interesting story thing. And like mm-hmm. you'll, it, it's not good for your character, but you'll go, "Yes, please, that's so great! It drives the story forward. It makes it more interesting." Mm-hmm. Our motto is basically, "What's a devil's bargain look like here?" Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, and well, it's gotten to a point now with the magpies, at least, where like sometimes I can't come up with a devil's bargain and then I'll just like toss it to the players of like, okay, what bad thing should happen here? And they will come up with some really awful stuff and it's still good. <laughs> I love games like that. Yeah. yeah. Those are good moments. I mean, we, yeah. you and I have played together before too. And you know that I feel that way of like, yes, yes. <laughs> make it horrible. <laughs> <laughs> make our children suffer. Yes. <laughs> Oh, there's a really beautiful couple of paragraphs in the book about that. It's just like, yeah, your character is going to fail and they're going to fail hard and that's how it works. And you just have to pick them up and realize you can get through this. It's just going to be difficult. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's- you're not you're not done yet. Get back in there, I think, is the, mm-hmm. the phrasing that's used. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's really good. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit about the history of the system, then. Uh, it looks like it was kickstarted in 2015? Yes. I actually, I backed it way back Ooh. when. <laughs> yeah, and raised the expert here. How yeah, it, it, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it, it so it was normally when I encounter a new RPG and I'm learning about it, my, for, my gut reaction is, oh, man, it would be so cool to build a character in this, um, you know, as as... I we imagine are the well show aware. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's the premise of this whole show. Blades of the Dark was the first system that I ever looked at and was like, I want to GM this. Ooh. Um it, it's just it's and I think part of it is because I'm very well, at the time I was very bad at GMing traditional or more traditional RPGs. Like I had attempted to to DM some D D and it had gone very badly. Mm. Um 
because I, I had fallen into kind of the new GM trap of like, oh, I have this beautiful story all planned out mm. and my players will travel through the story. And then we'd get yep. like 15 minutes into the first session and they're like, we're going to go over here. And I'm like, but my narrative. Um, yep. <laughs> but no, the map is over here. Yeah. And Blades in the Dark does not let you do that. You cannot as a GM do really like i do some prep work as a, as gm for the magpies because it is a a longer story and it's a slightly different situation than like a regular blades in the dark game because we are like it's a podcast we are telling a more organized narrative but like as a gm for blades you could roll into every session and be like all right what do you guys want to do and just let you it, it is a game designed to have the gm chasing the players rather mm-hmm. than the 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 gm leading the players uh through the story which like both of those types of of games are good but if you are someone like me who if i'm supposed to prepare a story i will write a novel (laughs) and then and then get sad when people aren't going through my novel this works really well because it's like i can't I can't really do that much preparation. Yeah. I just sort of have to let them go and follow after whatever uh, they end up chasing down. That sounds very familiar to myself. <laughs> I'm not a good or practice. Well, I'm not a practice GM, and I tend to panic on the spot. But Blades has been maybe one of my better successes in terms of like not panicking as much while GMing. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like they give you the tools to to really mm-hmm. GM on the fly pretty easily in this. Yes, like there's even a nifty chart of like all of those consequences of bad rolls, like depending on the position and the effect and things like that. It's yeah, very helpful. Very helpful for like on the fly being like, okay, so what happens now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's very cool. Yeah. Um, And then what is this forged in the dark thing all about? So um, uh, Blades has, has um, kind of spawned a whole bunch of um, sort of hacks and, and reskins uh, where people are taking kind of the core mechanics and putting them into different settings, uh, tweaking the system somewhat. Um, so the, the kind of analogy that I used is, is Forged in the Dark is kind of like Powered by the Apocalypse, Right. So it's Blades in the Dark is the original, Apocalypse World is the original, um, but then you kind of have this framework that people are taking and just doing all kinds of cool stuff with. Like the, I think the like one that's been published officially by Evil Hat is Scum and Villainy, which is Blades in the Dark in space. Yeah. Um, DC and has then, Mutants in the Night. Yeah, DC <laughs> is doing Mutants in the Night. Um, there, there's a lot of really cool ones just sort of in development. Some of them are affiliated with John Harper um, that were like stretch goals for the Kickstarter. So like there's one where it's like uh, you're playing as the blue coats who are the police in this oh. setting. Um, there's one where I think it's like about a, a revolution against the empire Broken that rules. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of different ones kind of in the setting, but then people are just going off and doing totally different things that don't have anything to do with the core blade setting. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's what Forged in the Dark is basically just like, we're using these mechanics to make a new game. That's awesome. I really wish I could remember who was doing this, but someone made like a Sailor Moon Forged in the Dark oh. game. Oh! You're, you are speaking my language What right is now. it? Oh, is it Girl by Moonlight? Girl by Moonlight, yeah. yes! Where can I get this? Hang on, seriously, I'm what? googling it right now. <laughs> <laughs> it I seems mean, like such a weird marriage of like the game type and then theme, but I'm sure it works. Yeah, because I mean I the mean, whole playbook type thing is more suited to that sort of yeah. genre fiction. Uh, I guess. Andrew Gills, I believe, is the the name of the. Let me. I think. Okay. Sorry. Google for is tangent. Google is not helping me with no. this very much. Um, but yeah, the the name oh. of the the magical girl one is Girl by Moonlight, and I've heard very good things about it. I haven't played it myself, but I've heard that it's it's extremely good. I will definitely have to check that out. Yeah, uh, have you played any <laughs> Forged in the Dark that isn't Blades yet, Ree? Because I sure have not. <laughs> um, no, I actually haven't. I've only I've I've so looked at some of the other when ones. We were like we were yeah. pirates briefly in one of my Blades games, but Ooh. I. I don't think that was a full hack necessarily. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one of the I questions. On this tangent. Oh, okay. <laughs> so one of the things that we like to go over before we really dig into everything is to discuss if there are any kind of 
terms or vocabulary that people might need to know as we go through this process. So do you guys have any um, any thoughts on what are things people might need to be aware of? So the one thing that I can think of kind of that that's sort of core for character creation um, are the actions. Um, so, you know, most systems you have abilities and skills and stats and whatever. Um, for blades, you have 12 actions available to you. And the, the, those are the things is how you interact with the world. Um, so when, uh, you know, in, in the game, the GM would call for an action roll. Um, and then you would pick whichever one of those actions you felt was, was best suited to uh, what you're trying to accomplish and, and make that roll. Um, the number of dots that you have in a given action is the number of dice that you roll. Um, and the, the die rolls are resolved by you pick the single highest result, generally speaking. Um, so like if I rolled 3d6 on a skill and I got a 1, a 3, and a 5, 5 is my result. I don't add them together. There's no... There's very little math in playing Blades in the Dark, which I also really like. <laughs> you know what, then I'll, like, go back to Blades when it's been a bit, and I've been playing a lot of PBTA games, and I'll, like, roll them and, like, try to add them together, and I'm like, no, that doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's, there's, I think there's one mechanic that requires you to subtract a die roll from six, but otherwise there's, there's really not any math. There's two. Yeah. Um... So, yeah, um, that's kind of the core thing for, for character creation is the action role. Um, let me look at a character sheet here and see what else. There are special abilities that every playbook has. And, I mean, those are very similar to, like, a PBTA-type playbook where you're, you, know, you, you pick from sort of a menu of, of special things that your character can do. Um, Blades is not a PBTA game. But it has like th those bones are still in there. It started off. It's it's got that. It has that influence. Okay. It's, it's listed as an inspiration in the front. Yeah. Of the book is basically it. I guess the other is this. Does this game is this the one with clocks? Yes. 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 Those don't really come up in character creation. Um, I feel like they're fairly central to like playing the game. Though, yes. Right? Yeah. They're definitely uh, a key part of play. Um, basically, a clock is a countdown to something happening, usually in a score that is something bad. So it's like, uh, you know, a lot of times it'll be like, okay, you all have been making a lot of noise trying to break into this place. So I'm going to start a four tick clock, which is literally just like I draw a circle and divide it into four quadrants. And consequences of rolls can tick up that clock at the GMs. Yeah, and then when it fills so, up, the guards find you. This is another mechanic that I like as far as keeping momentum yeah. for things. Yes, like this game's, yeah. I, again, I have not gotten to play it. It's one that it's been on my list of things that I'd really like to try. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems like Someday. so much of this game is built around like keeping things moving, yep. which is a huge problem in a lot of games. Like players stall out and you get kind yeah. of like overwhelmed by choices or you spend so much time in that planning and prep phase that you don't really get to actually do the thing. Um, yeah. I love that this game has all of these mechanics built in to force you to like suck it up and move forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's almost to the point that like you're so like jumping to action that you have to remind yourself to like stop and do some role play as well. <laughs> I struggled with that early on in Magpies. Yeah, I think we've definitely gotten better about no, that. No, we've gotten a lot better. And I think you've built in stuff. It's just that can happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think the other kind of key terms would be um, stress, which uh, is kind of the closest thing that this game has to, to hit points. Um, every character has nine stress boxes. And stress is basically like the scoundrels of this game are not like the, the normal people of Duskwall. They are not content with their lot in life. They have the ability to sort of draw on these inner reserves of strength to push themselves, literally as one of the mechanics, um, to do things that they can't normally do. So the mechanic push yourself, you take two points of stress and you get a bonus die. Hmm. So like you, even something where you have no skill in it, you can 
through a couple different mechanics, get some, you can take yourself from zero dice to like two dice um, by taking stress. Oh, wow. So, but then on the flip side, and this does tie into to character creation, you have to deal with that stress, as we all know. <laughs> yes. You cannot, you, you have to eventually <laughs> do something for stress release, and that is where character vices come in, which we'll get into in more detail uh, when we actually start building our characters. But um, yeah, stress is, is a pretty central mechanic. Um, and then vices actually become, it's very important that your character has some way of blowing off steam. Hmm. Interesting. There's really not a lot. You can pretty much just jump into Blade's creation almost yeah. with no, yeah, <laughs> like with no previous prep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's very is... like PBTA that way that you can just kind of hop in and quickly whip up a character. Very cool. Yeah, I do. I do see a, a lot of different options on the character sheets that you had provided for us. So. I'm really excited to get to us. Is there yeah. anything else that we would need to know before we hop into it? Not that I can really think of. Um, it's dark. Dark with a, a chance of blades. <laughs> there is actually, occasionally at, at, uh, at sunrise and sunset, you can see the, the shattered remains of the sun. But otherwise, it's just dark. There is a moon. Mm. Is it cold there then, too? Um, kind of... Yes. The, the it has weather- three seasons, and most of those seasons involve fog. <laughs> yeah, well, at least at least in Duskwall, there's, uh, and we'll talk That's about this true. a little bit with the kind of the character backgrounds there. The heritages. the The book specifically says to not expect realism in terms of like yeah. how climate works. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's fair. There's this magic. was a storybook fantasy world of magic and wonders, which was yeah. destroyed and an industrial civilization was built on top of the ruins. Don't expect scientific realism here. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, you can explain anything with magic. Yeah. And it's all it's all internally consistent. Uh-huh. Uh, well, that's like the biggest. Are you sure? Because I'm pretty okay. sure the stars shift. Well, no, no, no. Yeah. I mean, no, I mean, no, I, I'm joking. <laughs> the rule, the rules of the world are internally consistent. Do they have any connection to the functioning rules of how our world works? Don't Not worry so about it. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I play Why? a game that has snake people in it, so like, yeah, I get it's you. Fine. The, the, the stars in the sky move around. The stars in the ocean, not so much. Yeah. There's stars Sometimes in the ocean. Sometimes there's little... Yes. The more you know. Yeah. Little double images of the moon called Dimmer Sisters. Huh. Why is that? Who knows? <laughs> also, the ocean is pitch black and reflects a starry sky that is not the starry sky above it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's it's unclear if it's a reflection or if you're just looking down into something. It's, it's a That's lot. not unsettling at all. If there's yeah. a way for the world to be unsettling, it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, <laughs> like, I haven't, like, thoroughly read the setting section, so we will eventually just pull out these random tidbits of total <laughs> insanity, and then we'll all just stop and be like, Wait, what? Yeah, <laughs> when I He also has beautiful theories about <laughs> the cataclysm. Yeah. <laughs> this sounds like a setting where I would just be like theorizing and hypothesizing about oh, why yeah. things and are it, the way they are. Last it, night I wrote 800 words about the historiography in the world <laughs> because yeah. I'm bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're awesome, no, you're and it's going to be amazing. I'm super excited about this. Be up for patrons I, I, I need at some to, point. <laughs> I, I need to get started on my fashion blog. <laughs> I think I have an idea for my character now. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> all right. Well, with all of that out of the way, how about let's make some people? Let's make some people. Yeah. My favorite yes. part of the show. <laughs> I think that the place I want to start with this is if you can I know that there's like a lot of different character types here but like if you can give us a quick rundown maybe of like what our choices are here. Yes, I I can do that. Please. Um <laughs> So, um yeah, there are seven playbooks available um and they are The Cutter uh, which are the kind of Punch kid. yeah they're they're the fighters and brawlers um, intimidator you know it, it, the the tough guys um, the hound which is um, a sharpshooter and tracker um, they have a uh, a hunting pet which leads to some of my favorite character innovations people always <laughs> just go buck wild with the the pets for their characters it's very good. <laughs> 
The leech um, is an alchemist and saboteur. Um, the lurk is uh, the sneak thief type. They they are stealthy and good at breaking into places. Uh, the slide is the party face. They are um, manipulative and deceitful and good at talking to people. The spider is um, kind of the mastermind. They uh, have are good at conspiracies and and planning. A lot of their special abilities have to do with kind of those um, flashback maneuvers that we talked about um, of basically making sure that everyone was was perfectly prepared for whatever catastrophe they're in. Uh, and then the whisper um, is kind of the arcane occult expert. They uh, tend to deal with the the weird stuff, the ghosts, the demons, all of those things that that are in the city. Hmm. Very nice. Yeah, Ryan, I want you to know that going yeah. into this, I was like, yeah. you know what, I'm gonna like be outside of my box because like <laughs> you really inspired me with Dirge Stranglethorn and <laughs> Crescendo Restriction Bush. Yes. Um, but all of these are my jam. So well, right. <laughs> I don't and know what to there's do. There's one in because particular like... that I'm like seeing that you would probably instantly pick right away. But is it the I, I was thinking the spider for Amelia. That but, one is very good. Spider. But pretty much, yeah, pretty much anything. Um, I would imagine you would be pretty. There are none of them that I was like, mm, not that. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. So one other thing that I will say, um, that this is not how character creation is written out in the book, but I find it to be a little more effective for, for building characters, is in addition to building our characters, we will also build a crew. There are, some, there are crew types, um, and I find that it's helpful not to build the crew first, but to pick the crew type. Um, because... You might play a hound no matter what, but the type of hound that you're going to build for a group of assassins versus a group of thieves versus a group of smugglers mm. are probably going to be kind of different. Yep. Um, so if you, I, I can run through the, the crew types, just yeah, sort of like this is what they do, and then we can be like, okay, we're going to be a crew of this, and then Perfect. we can... Okay. So the crew types... So there are six crew types. Um, there are assassins. It's pretty obvious what they do. Bravos uh, are basically like street toughs. They do smash and grabs and extortion and intimidation. The type who come down the street snapping at you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, uh, you can be a cult um, of worshiping a some kind of forgotten god. Um, Hawkers uh, are vice dealers. They are selling some kind of vice to the people of the city. Shadows um, are thieves. That is what the magpies started out as. Um, and, and smugglers. Spies. Yeah. And abuse and not, spies, and we never did either of those much. Yeah. Not, <laughs> not good at being shadows, but that is what they were officially. Um, so those are the thief types. And then smugglers, which, again, pretty obvious what they do. Mm -hmm. So are any of those... I don't know. Are any of those uh, appealing to people in terms of what kind of crimes do we want to do? I am the worst person to pick our crew playbook because, <laughs> <laughs> like, everybody, everybody's like, hashtag no crime, hashtag crime is good, hashtag crime is good, and I'm like, hashtag, hashtag save crime is good. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, you're such a good boy. I hashtag try. be gay do crime be gay do crime <laughs> yeah um so i'll, I'll leave this up to anybody Ooh. ryan can we be a cult we can be i i was gonna leave this 100 percent up to everybody else so if we want to be a cult i will lean hard into being a cult i'm down with being a cult i've never done that before i've only done cults for one shots because i don't know it's weirdly tough to think of like score scenarios for them yeah. Oh, there's there's a list of suggested scores oh, yeah, for definitely. for that in the book. So thankfully, yeah. we don't I've have to play them. We just yeah. have to make them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so a cult. We're gonna be let's be a cult. Cult. Okay. Let's be a cult. Okay. Hooray! All right. So Hooray. yeah, like like I said, the... cults are okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, now now we can with kind of that in mind of like okay, we're gonna be cultists. You can sort of build your character in that direction. Excellent. Okay, I mean, I feel like if that's the case, I'm going to, like, lean hard into 
my hashtag brand. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Somebody's I mean, I can't not. Blood magic. What does that I'm sound like? I'm going to do some. Yep. <laughs> All right. I, if sorry, I, what? If I want to do blood magic, whisper. Cool. Yeah. yeah that's what I figured. <laughs> yeah. I was going to, that's why I said whisper, because that's yeah. like the most blood magic thing in the whole thing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. If you want to do. We'll do actual blood magic in this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I am familiar with pretty much all the playbooks, so I'm going to let everybody else pick, and then right. I, will, I will pick from whatever is, is left. So is it, uh, like, good practice to each pick a different playbook, uh, or it, do people generally uh, double up on some of them sometimes? Yeah, there's, there seems like enough options to have two very different people the same playbook, although people seem to tend towards playing different playbooks. Yeah, yeah. You, you could... If you wanted to double up, if we wanted to have a, a couple whispers or, or whatever, we could definitely do that. Okay. Uh, again, kind of because it's a game where the, the GM is following the players. If the players were like, we're all going to be whispers, the GM would be like, okay, uh, you are going to be dealing with ghosts every session because that is what you're geared for. Um, so it, this isn't really a game where it's like, okay, we mm-hmm. need to have a balanced party. The GM is going to present a challenges kind of based on what your crew is okay. um so yeah if, if you can double up if you want in terms of playbook the mm-hmm. majority of the games that i've been involved with people always pick different things though so i mean generally i feel like we would want to just to show off all the different yeah, exactly. things that you can do yeah <laughs> i think we i want to go i think i want to go a little out of my comfort zone and go with slide okay that's okay Ooh. yeah slide's Sweet. fun yeah, that's, that's Josie's character. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I, because my comfort zone is the uh, yeah super social charismatic character. Yeah, which is weird because I don't consider myself that much very that much ca- charismatic. No, I'm, but I'm the same way, Josie. <laughs> Thus, the whisper, <laughs> no, the whisper spider. I always mix those two up in my head. I play the yeah. spider on our bus. Yeah, I I, I want to be. I want to be a violence girl, so I'm thinking either hound or cutter. Yeah. So given that we're a cult, I kind of want to go with hound, because I feel like there's very silly hunting companion possibilities. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. And you yeah. can guide us through the Deathlands, Yeah, when we inevitably end up there. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Alright, what are you thinking, Minna? Ugh. Indecision. <laughs> this is always like one of the harder parts is like settling on a gosh darn playbook. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we, we have what a whisper, a slide, and a hound so mm-hmm. far. I'm trying to think what's most fun with a cult. I mean, everything is fun with a cult if you I do know. it right. <laughs> cults are fun. <laughs> hashtag We're cults the are cult fun. Of fun. Isn't there like a cult related hashtag today about my <laughs> or yesterday? Oh, uh, I'm not big on cults or something, I think. Uh, Steph was listening to episode one and had a whole <laughs> bunch of hashtags. Oh, indecision. Sorry, once again. What are you thinking, Ray? I'm kind of leaning towards Lurk. Ooh. Yeah? Yeah. If it helps by removing an option, <laughs> I'll, I'll claim, please, I'll grab the Lurk. Please grab Lurk, because okay. that was somewhere on my short list. <laughs> um, I'm going to go for a leech, then. Ooh. All right. I've never done a leech, which means I don't have a sheet built for it, but whatever. <laughs> so we've got a hound, a leech, a lurk, a slide, and a whisper. No spider. Yeah. Who needs plans? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who needs plans? John Harper, 2K15. <laughs> yeah. Um. So that is... Where's my so that there there are eight steps to character creation in Blades. So that's Ooh. step one is choose a playbook. Woo, we did it. Yeah, That's we did. did the thing. Yeah. Yep. Um, so then the second step, if you open up the the character sheet uh, of your chosen playbook, the the second thing is to pick your heritage, um, which is kind of over in like that top left block with like name and all that stuff. So your heritage refers to um, your family background. Uh, the the items listed under heritage um, are the the different uh, island regions in uh, the empire. So Akoros, the Dagger Isles, Eruvia, Severos, Scovlin, and Tykeros. Each of them kind of has like 
sort of a, a, a short description of, of what kind of people are, are there. Um, Akoros is the island that Duskwall is on. Um, it's kind of the like Central Europe equivalent. There's a lot of mountains, petrified forests. Um, people tend to be like pale skin, dark hair. Um, and then you have Eruvia, which is a land of uh, black sand deserts and volcanoes. Um, and people there have uh, darker skin and dark hair. It's kind of drawing culturally on like India and Persia. Tykeros is weird. <laughs> is the is basically what you get about Tykeros. Everyone there is. Let me repeat that without my chair clicking. Everyone there is demon blooded in some way. So people from Tykeros have some kind of weird features. Um, Blair on the Magpies is Tykerosi, and she has horns and super pale eyes and fangs and I think pointed ears. Kim went kind of a more like traditional sort of demonic depiction with her, but you can go kind of whatever you want to do. Like there is a character in the book who's Taika Rosie, whose lower half is a snake. Yeah. They can, they give you the what, advice really? of like, you can have feathers for hair or shark eyes. Um, just if you're from Tykeros, you just have some kind of weird physical trait that is a manifestation of your demon blood. So with your heritage, you kind of pick where you want your background to be from. Um, there's more details about kind of each of the, the regions in the little shorthand um, notes section that I sent you, Ryan and Amelia, if you want to look at those in more detail. Also, um, you have the book, page 53 has a really good rundown of what that says about your character. Yeah, so you pick kind of where your, your character's heritage is from, and then you add some sort of detail about your family. So, like, you could be um, Aruvian diplomats or um, Scovlin refugees or, uh, you know, Akarosian merchants. You just sort of pick a, a short detail about what, what, was your, what, what is your family heritage? What do they do? And so that is kind of the, the first thing that you fill in for your character. Okay. Hmm. Oh. Like, I'm kind of intrigued by the, like, super weird uh, Tykeros <laughs> one. Yep. But my goodness, uh, the options. Yeah, I mean, I feel like Tykeros could have a lot of thematic resonance with our cult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very true. That's very true. Uh, let's see. Choose. Oh, there's so many things. <laughs> okay. Oh, there it is. I found the Shattered Isles. Yes. Oh, there's a little map. Yeah. I love maps. <laughs> yes. You're like so this genuinely book has excited about such things, right? Good maps. Uh huh. The little like neighborhood maps and everything are just aces. Yeah. I think there's a map that like breaks down like wealth by district. Yeah. Which is very handy if you are planning robberies or burglaries, I suppose. Or both. I was kind of intrigued by the Dagger Isles. Yes. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Just by name alone, and now that I'm looking at it, it would add a bit of mystery to my character, I believe. Yeah, the Dagger Isles uh, are like jungles and have a lot of like sailors and privateers yeah. coming from there. They live there without lightning barriers, possibly. Yes. How do they do that? Well, I'll, Who knows? I'll never tell. <laughs> also, how do they have jungles? <laughs> yeah, Who that's knows? yeah. I feel like the that's jungles are actually a bigger. Me. That's a bigger question. Is like, there's no sunlight. How are there jungles? Magic. Yeah, very creepy jungles <laughs> they are. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, they or, do or like what those plants at the bottom of the ocean jungles. do. <sighs> hmm. Do what those plankton do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like um, keto synthesis or something like that. Oh yeah. yeah. Or they just live off of blood. Okay, no los dos. Yeah. <laughs> well, why and not? All of these Me too, plausible. jungle plants. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so I I am going to actually go with one of the things that I, I suggested and go with Eruvian diplomats for my uh, character's background, which I feel like already is going to raise a lot of questions as mm -hmm. to how mm -hmm. the, the child of a, a, a diplomatic family wound up in a cult. That's Doing interesting, crime. because uh -huh. I, I went with the Dagger Isles Noble. Ooh, all right. Ooh. Yeah. So we've got some disaffected uh -oh. rich kids up in here. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, riffing on that theme, I think I'm going to be from Severos, um, and not necessarily necessarily rich, but maybe like exiled princess or something. Ooh, like we have all like I don't know. Th- let me let me throw something out here. Like we've all been like divorced from like our heritage or power in some way. Ooh. So now we look to the cult for that. Yeah, that's kind of mm-hmm. that's kind of what I was thinking when uh, when I picked noble. Like somebody who either it's like a cult that um, you only know about because you are so affluent in the society um, Mm -hmm. or it's something that we ran to because we wanted to get rid of our uh, our heritage or what or whatever. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of lot of interesting potential there. But this is character creation cast. We get to make sense of it afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think my character is also going to be a Ruvian, but I think her her family ran a temple there. I don't Ooh. know if that temple is still there. Okay, cool. Was it a cultist temple? I think it was a temple to a forgotten god. <laughs> oh, wow. Or, or at least a, a god that has. It, it wasn't the official state religion. From which. Here's a fun fact. Ruvia, this is, I not. swear to God, not making this up. The name of the official religion, the state religion in this game is the Church of the Ecstasy of the Flesh. Oh. Oh. That makes sense. So the reason for this is <laughs> it, it is that when, like, in, in this world, you know, like a lot of religions in the real world, there's this idea that, like, the, the, the body is, is sinful and weak and the spirit is holy. That is inverted in this setting. Spirits are bad because when you die, your spirit becomes a ghost that wants to eat everyone. Yeah, it makes sense. Right. So this is a setting where the body and the physical are sacred. Mm. Um, and so it leads to some really cool things where it's like physical pleasure and physical comfort are very important in this society. So like, yeah, it. The church sounds like a sex thing, and to be fair, that's probably a lot of it. <laughs> but it also is just like good food, good clothing, being like physically comfortable, physically satisfied in whatever way that means. Um, so it creates these some really interesting like social dynamics that I've I've had some fun with in Magpies. Yeah. That's Can I cool. also say that this this uh, religion because it repudiates the flesh and. Or repudiates the spirit, sorry, and and raises the flesh above everything. Has some really really terrifying human experimentation involved. Oh. There's also that involving taking spirits out of bodies because the most holy person is a person without a spirit. Oh wow! There's also they also uh, yes, there is no, also they're really, that. They're, they're, mm. <laughs> that doesn't it's sound great. nice. No, it's not great. So they lure you in with the the fun stuff, and then they're just like, "By the way, <laughs> we're just we're just gonna take your soul." Yeah, it's just, just hoovering up souls. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> oh. oh, I forgot that the empty vessel also does that practice. Oh. Yeah. yeah so pe- what are you gonna get into? <laughs> well, good thing we're in a cult. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna because my goal here is just to like lean all the way into this. Um, I'm gonna go with Tykeros. Yeah. And I'm going to say, I feel like some kind of like high priests or something like that. Oh, yeah. Nice. I like that. Um, we both came from religious backgrounds. Yeah. So so everybody's got some some pretty high up connections. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. Um, okay. So the step three in character creation for Blades is choose a background. This is your personal history. Um, and so, again, there are... Um, some some kind of broad categories listed there: um, academic, labor, law, trade, military, noble, or underworld. So this is basically what you did before uh, you got into crime. If you have always been doing crime, you want to pick underworld. <laughs> mm. And then, similarly, you pick kind of the broad category, and then add a a specific detail of um, you know what you were before. So um, again, kind of, I guess, grabbing an example from, from the magpies, um, Blair, our whisper um, is uh, her background is academic um, university dropout. She was enrolled at one of the universities. Um, 
she, I mean, guess, I guess she technically didn't drop out so much as was expelled for some questionable decisions it's that she may thing. have made. Um, but anyway, that's Don't worry her about back- it. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Um, but that's her background. So that's kind of the sort of thing you're thinking is like, what, what did you do before, before you did crime? Okay. I think I'm going to go with military. Okay. Um, because looking at Severos, like mm-hmm. they're nomadic horse warriors, right? So I'm immediately thinking Mongols with that. So even if she's an exiled princess, that probably means she's a very, very good warrior first, and then a yeah, <laughs> and then warrior first, noble second. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm gonna put military dash warlord down. Ooh, <laughs> cool. I'm glancing at the special abilities. Hmm. So I, I kind of leaned a little bit into the the noble aspect of things. Um, so so it sounds like we're doing like pick one from the this list and kind of uh, quantify it somehow with a yeah with add a word. detail add a detail. Okay, so uh, heritage uh, the Dagger Isles uh, princess, and I'm gonna go with a noble background still like she was she's mm-hmm. always been a noble, uh, but a socialite. Okay. I love that. I can't so, look. I'm stuck. There's like a word that I'm looking for and it's like in my brain and I can't get what to it. What kind of a word? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> I mean, is there a general area? No, it's like a from? it's a term for you know, when people believe that like kings or emperors or whatever are divine right. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good. That's the I word. gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> that political science degree coming in handy. Yes. <laughs> I got one of those too. Yeah. I love that uh, Blades in the Dark is letting us all use our useless degrees. <laughs> yeah. So I am actually I'm going with academic, and there there are two universities uh, in Duskwall. Uh, one of them, um, Duskwall Academy or Duskfall Academy, has uh, something called the College of Immortal Sciences, which is just cool. Um, and that is the college that focuses on like theology and philosophy and stuff. So I, I think that my lurk, I, I'm not quite sure what happened yet to, to take her from uh, that to where she is today. Uh, but we'll find out. But I think that's, that's her background. I think that she, she was studying theology and philosophy and some other weird stuff at a really prestigious university here. I think I want to do law. So that's going to be like involved with law enforcement or like being like a lawyer or a blue coat or. Hmm. So maybe academic is more. Yeah. What, what so were you what thinking? Are you thinking? So, ooh. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to figure out like exactly what I want this position to be, but I want it to be like pretty close to actual leadership, like not, you know, like right hand. I think you could probably, um, you. I think you could probably do like law or nobility for that. Yeah, because like nobility doesn't necessarily have to mean titled. It just is like you had access to the the halls of power, right? So like a vizier or something. <gasps> yeah, that sounds pretty cool. <laughs> Mostly because then you get to have been a vizier, which is one of the coolest titles. Oh. Have you ever <laughs> seen the Arabian playbooks? I don't know who came up with them, but they're very good. There is a vizier playbook in that set. <laughs> oh. Nice. <laughs> Josie, did you have yours yet? Uh, yeah, I went with uh, military. Oh, right, right, right. Warlord. The warlord I'm the one. Indecisive holdout, as usual. <laughs> <laughs> I don't normally make characters on the fly, actually. It's surprisingly <laughs> difficult. I'm full of indecision always. So I have, like, a mental image of, like, with her heritage, I have, like, a pretty clear mental image in that she, like, helped in the temple and, like, maybe was a healer of some sort. I just don't know how to narrow that as a background. (laughs) Um, Yeah. I hate to do academic just because I don't want to be a Ruvian, another Ruvian academic. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, but that could lead to some interesting stuff for us of, Mm -hmm. like, maybe we knew each other. Mm Mm-hmm. That's true. I think she was also more academic or more practiced that stuff more back in Aruvia, and now she's mm. like unmoored from her homeland and like trying to find a way here. 
I mean, so was it more more of a practical application of that, though? I mean, could you do, like, labor? That's true. And, it could be labor. I was or, thinking or trade. Maybe. Trade is kind of, like, skilled. That's true. Um, yeah. Yeah, maybe that's how she made it here, too, is that she applied her skills on the road. Yeah. Going with uh, the trade healer background. Yep. Nice. I'm going to go with trade healer. All right. Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests, or even some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used in today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the products can be found in the show notes. Also, check the notes or the website for cool stuff to go with each character, such as dice or mixtapes. Thanks for joining us, and remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation, so go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you will find other great shows like Total Party Kill. Total Party Kill is a weekly live Twitch stream where John Patrick Cohen, Eddie Klinker, and James Dugan play through Cephalofair Games' Gloomhaven. Join them in the stream to play along through the action and interact with a constantly changing cast of characters and special guests, or watch them after the fact on the One Shot YouTube channel. TPK airs Thursdays at 7 p.m. Central Time at twitch.tv slash one shot RPG.